a pleasure and privilege to be able to come and serve the family and the kingdom of God. And uh, I mean, I just, I'm so thankful, even as uh, Elder Thomas was praying and you guys are praying, I just felt a fresh release of the mantle of anointing upon me. I just want to thank God for that. I just want to thank God for bringing us together. And I believe that God has got a word for all of us. Amen. And God wants to speak to us and God wants to touch every one of our hearts. Um, next week, you'll have Pastor Lawrence Lee. It looks like uh, they are sending all the Lees into this place. So all the holy people. <laughs> and we're all one family. <laughs> and we thank God that Lee is a universal name. It's so powerful. He says, what about Malays? Yes, we have Ali. You know, when I go for reservists, they always call me Ali, Ali. <laughs> and what about Indians, you have the Bengalis. So we have all the leaves, which is very, very universal. And we just want to thank God that together we are one holy family. All right, so let's, let's pray, shall we? Just spend this time in the presence of the Lord. And just, like I said, like last week, relax. You're in church. You're not in the marketplace, all right? So just rest in the presence of the Lord and just allow Him to pour out His presence into our lives. How much you can receive is dependent on how open you are. How open you are to the Lord in saying, Lord, come and fill me. That's why John the Baptist says that he must increase and I must decrease because we are all that finite container. There's only that much that we can receive. So may the Lord just help us. Help us to receive as we release everything to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you're able to pray in the Spirit, just pray in the Spirit for a moment. Because as you pray in the Spirit, you're sensitizing your spirit, man. Yeah, just coming into this communion with the Lord. Allowing the Holy Spirit to just work in your heart. Even as the Lord says, there are times of refreshing right now. Times of refreshing. In His presence, there is peace. In His presence, there is fullness of joy. In His presence, there is abundance. That we are not happy just with being ankle deep or knee deep, not even waist deep, but deep enough to swim in the river, the river of God. Right now, the river of God is flowing. Father, we just want to thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for your presence here, Lord. We know that, Lord... Lord, when two or three who are gathered in your name, you're in the midst of us, Lord. And Father, we thank you there's no geographical barrier. We thank you, Lord, for technology. We thank you, Lord, that you have invaded into every heart, every home, even as we turn on, as we listen. We know, Lord, you're right there. Lord, we know you're omnipresent. And Father, we pray, O oh God, that you continue to minister to each one of our hearts, each one of our lives. And Father, I pray that your word that goes forth will not return to you void, but will accomplish your purposes, Lord. We just want to give you all the praise, give you all the glory. We commit this time to you, Lord. We pray that you just speak to us, minister to us, and touch our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The topic is, let us run with perseverance. Perseverance is a very powerful word. Perseverance is a very strong word, and I believe all of us need perseverance. Amen? And so we just want to draw from the Scripture, we just want to draw from the Word of God, what are some of the important lessons for all of us, because we are all runners. We are all in the same race. All of us are running this race, and we need perseverance. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need perseverance. Amen? You need perseverance. And by now, we should know that as Christians, as we in this Christian life, it's not a hundred meters dash. It's actually like a marathon that you keep running and running and running and running and running and running right till you finish right, the finishing line. It's not a hundred meters dash 
that, you know, you're flesh in a pan, you just accepted Christ, and then after that, the rest of our lives, we forget about the Lord, and we try to do our own stuff, and things like that. We know that the moment when we receive the Lord, it requires a lot of commitment, it requires dedication, that every single day is dying to self, that we take up the cross daily and follow the Lord. Amen? That every single day that we just let the Lord lead us, guide us, direct us, that we live our lives to the fullest. And we know that God has got a plan and a purpose for our lives. Just like last week we were looking at this title, God's uh, Unfolding of God's Plan. God has a plan for all of our lives. And it takes a lot of unfolding. And we need to keep persevering in terms of receiving what God has in store for you and for me. And we know that God's plans are great. God plans, God's plans are good. And of course, today we need to run with perseverance. And the Bible is a very practical book. Can you say amen to that? The Bible teaches us the truth. The Bible teaches us His ways. The Bible teaches us His will. And we know that we can receive the revelation as we look into the pages of the Bible. You know, many times as a pastor, people come up to me and say, Hey, pastor, you know, uh, I want to discern and know the will of God. And so I ask them, how often do you read the Word of God? And they say, oh, no, it's on a shelf, you know. And I'm a collector of Bibles. I've got NIV, I've got NESV, I've got uh, NKJV, I've got the Good News, I've got the Message, I've got a whole long list. I say, use the computer, don't buy so many. I'm just kidding. So it's, you need to understand that God's will is revealed through His Word. And so we ask how often do you read the Word of God and how often we understand the Word of God so that we can apply the Word of God and we know that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path. It leads us, guides us, and directs us. I'm sure all of us have heard this. B-I-B-L-E stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. We need to always refer to the owner's manual. The sad thing is many times we buy a gadget, we buy an appliance, we buy some electronic stuff, the last thing that we ever do is actually to read the owner's manual. We need to read the owner's manual in order to understand how to operate because it gives us insight and understanding. And so we need to run with perseverance right to the very end. Just like Joseph, when he was given the dream and the vision that he's going to be someone who's going to be so mightily used by Yahweh. But it takes a lot of time for that to unfold. He has got to go through the pit before he gets into the palace. And even worse, the pit into the prison and then to the palace and to be the prime minister. So it takes a series. It takes unfolding. And the Lord is unfolding this even in our lives. And God is guiding us every single day. And we need to run with perseverance. Say perseverance. It's severe. It's really severe. It's something that is so important. We need to keep at it and going at it. It's a race right to the very end. This is a very funny story. I remember it was, I was in pre-U2. Nowadays, they don't use this term, pre-U2. It's JC now, right? We have a cross-country run, and it's in McRitchie Reservoir. How many have done running, running in the McRitchie Reservoir? How many of you love running? Join the army. <laughs> I mean, I never like running, you know. So it's a five kilometers running through the forest of the reservoir. And so we're running and running. The sun is up and it's hot, it's humid. And then, hey, how come lesser and lesser people, you know, because they're all running ahead. And I was running, I was giving my bears, I was just running up and down the slopes and up and down the terrain and all the uneven grounds. And after that, in the long stretch, and the long uh, Leone Road is a long stretch. I mean, it's like you can never see the end, right? So you have to persevere. You got to keep running and say, yes, Lord, I need to run and run and run and run. And right towards the, the part that is right at a car park when you're nearing the end. And all of them, I hear so much hand clapping. And all of a sudden, I was in this delusion of grandeur. Oh, these guys are clapping for me, you know. I must be right. First few people who, who ran the race and, and they are going to be there for me and they're welcoming me back. And lo and behold, guess what? 
It was already prize giving and they were receiving the prizes because the, all the clap was for the people who were receiving the prize and I was the last one running back. So the moral of the story is that don't run. No, I'm just kidding. The moral of the story is that you've got to keep running, you've got to keep persevering right to the very end. It's not the first person, it's the person who finishes the race. So is there a difference between endurance and perseverance? Endure is the measure of a person's stamina or persistence. Whereas perseverance is continuing in a course of action without regard to discouragement, opposition, or previous failure. It's just like the, you know, the little door with the rounded bottom. It's called the, in Mandarin, it's called Pu Tao Ong. You come across that? You push it down, it comes out. You push it down, it comes out. When I was a kid, I like to play with that. And I get very fascinated because we, I don't understand the physics behind it. I don't understand the dynamics behind it. But you try to push it down, it gets up. Try to push it down, it gets up. Push it down, it gets up. And, and we should be like that Christian Pu Tao Ong, you know, so that when we go through life situation, we always come back. We always come back. We always come back. Just like uh, Brother David was saying, even in times when we falter, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he falls, he will not be utterly cast down because the Lord upholds him with his righteous right hand. So we know God is consistently and constantly watching over us and the good news to all of us is that he neither sleeps nor slumbers. Have you ever heard God snore? He doesn't sleep. He's always with us. He neither sleeps nor slumber. He's always watching over us. And even last week we were talking about He has constantly plans for us. He's constantly thinking of us, how to bless us, how to prosper us, how to protect us, how to fill us with His presence and His goodness and His amazing grace. And we know that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we dwell in the presence of the Lord. God is constantly watching over us. Not too long ago, there is this term that came up, the strawberry generation. If you do a search in the Wikipedia, right, it's actually referring to why, why strawberry and not durians? Because strawberries are easily bruised. So they, they rot very easily. And so it's actually, uh, I think it was from Taiwan, talking about people who are born from the 1990s, like not me, like some people here, please don't be offended, that in the 1990s, and of course in the West, they call it the millennials or the Gen Z, you know, or Z, whatever, um, US or British way of pronouncing it. And so it refers to people who are bruised easily, not able to work hard or withstand social pressure, and you always feel a sense of entitlement. You come across people like that. It's like everybody owes them a living, you know, kind of thing, you know. So some of those some of those people have got this kind of attitude, and they are being overprotected by their parents in an environment of economic prosperity. I'm sure all of us remember the picture that was taken by somebody seeing the helper carrying the backpack of an NS boy. So they call this the strawberry generation. In other words, there's no resilience. They are not able to withstand pressure or not able to persevere. So we need to constantly remind ourselves, let us not be strawberry Christians. Because we know that life is tough. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that it's not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. We need God. We need the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us, lead us, empower us to live our lives so that we can be victorious, so that we can be overcomers, so that we can be more than conquerors. It's not by our own human strength. All we need to do is to submit and surrender and yield ourselves to the Lord and God is going to lead us and guide us and direct us and God is going to help us along the way. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live, I no longer live by the power of the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. We do not want to cave in and compromise because there's so much pressure and the spirit of worldliness. Everybody is pulling us apart and wanting us to follow their ways and their directions and their agenda. 
So we need to understand that the moment that we wake up, everybody is trying to have a piece of us, especially the enemy, because he wants to destroy the relationship that we have with the Lord. His vision or his mission statement is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So we need to be fully aware. We need to be awakened. We need to ask the Lord to help us to be overcomers. And today we want to look at this passage, right? And we're going to do a little bit of exposition, like a little Bible study. And I think this is something which I hope all of us can, can learn because we need to feed ourselves. We cannot always just depend on a weekend meal in order to survive, right? So the normal question or the normal questions that we need to ask as we do a simple inductive Bible study is to ask these few questions. Who, what, when, why, and how? So each time when we look into a passage that we always look for all these things and ask ourselves these things, and to allow the Holy Spirit to bring revelation and to bring a rhema word to us so that when we read it, there will be such a deep conviction. And the most important thing is to apply. So you have observation, you have interpretation, and then you have the application. Do not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word as well. So it's important for all of, us, all of us. We need to keep growing as a Christian. Like I said, we cannot depend on just weekend messages to feel us and to feed us. We need to start feeding ourselves. You know, sometimes we get accused in churches where they say, oh, this church is not feeding me properly and this church is not giving me enough or sufficient things like that. You know, many a times I take a lot of supplements. I'm a sucker for supplements. Because sometimes whatever we eat is insufficient, especially if the diet is chakwitiao and fishball noodles and wonton mean and all kind of stuff. So we need to supplement our health with all these supplements. And so likewise, we need to learn how to feed ourselves. So I think it's important for us not just to learn from, from weekend services, but every single day, let there be a fresh encounter that when we read the Word, the Word just comes out and the Holy Spirit will just convict us. The Holy Spirit will just grant us the strength and encouragement and to enable us to be empowered by the Word of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So I've actually highlighted some of these things because at a point of inspiration as I was preparing this, these are the things that would jump up and jump out so that we can just capture this. And may this be something that we can learn together. It's taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Let's read this together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose hearts." Amen? Let's pray and close in prayer. No, just kidding. So we have all these things. Throw off everything that hinders. What? Sins that so easily entangles. Run with perseverance. The race is already marked out for all of us. Every single one of us, there's a race that's being marked out for us. And how do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And what did he do? The joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning his shame, and now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. The exhortation given to all of us is consider, be mindful, always think of that, of him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what does this simply mean? It means that it's very easy to lose heart. We are living in this world that constantly bombards us with all kinds of 
thoughts, all kinds of suggestions, all kinds of temptations, and, and everything. We are constantly being, you know, uh, affected by all these things. And so we need to just ask the Lord to help us to consider, to keep fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus, the author and finisher or the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Just now we read through passage, the passage is actually taken from the New American Standard Version. So right now, if you look at Bible Gateway, you can actually use so many various versions for you to have a better understanding in terms of its translation. So it's important for us to get different facets or different aspects so that we can learn and grow in the Word of God. So we want to ask ourselves, what are some of the lessons that we can actually glean from this verse or this passage from verses 1 to 3? Right? First of all, we are reminded, there's a run. This is a run. And all of us are running in it. Whether you like it or not, we have to run. Let us run this race that is marked out for all of us. So this is a race that God has marked out for us. And the good news is that it's our race. We run one race. We don't run other people's races, right? We don't go to the next lane. We have our own lane and we have to keep to our lane. You know, now these cars are very smart. They have, uh, you know, the uh, anti veering into other lanes, you know, and, and the moment you fall asleep and you sort of veer off the lane and pulls you back. And these are the smart cars that we have today. And there are rules for this race. It's actually something that we ourselves are accountable for. In other words, I'm not accountable for another person's race. I have my own race to run. And as long as I'm running this race, and if it's possible, the Lord can use me to encourage other people. It's just like, hey, come on, let's keep running, let's keep running, let's keep running, and just persevere. You know, sometimes we see some, some people who are lagging behind. We, we just encourage the person, and we know that in this journey, in this Christian life, there are laggers. And some people are really able to have a kind of stamina and perseverance, and we keep asking everybody else to continue running this race. So if we are slacking or we are lagging, there are people who come alongside us and say, come on, just, just keep running. And we know that God is going to use every one of us in different ways to encourage others. It's like the swimming race. You know, we have our own lanes. Just imagine Joseph schooling lane four and suddenly he switched to lane five, then after that lane seven, then after that, you know, he will never finish the race. We have our own race to run. Just like bowling, we have our own lanes, right? As we bowl. I tell you, the first time I bowled, it was a nightmare. I was 15 years old. I learned how to bowl. And the first time I bowled, you know, it's so like, well, we'll see it, or the kind of the angle, and you try to hold the ball, and you think of those days, there's this champion by the name of S.Y. Lowe. You know, he's a south, south Paul. He just well, hook the ball, and the ball will go spinning, and I tried to do that. I hooked the ball and guess what? Went to the next lane. The guy stared at me and he almost wanted to strangle me or throw the ball at me. I wasted one of his uh, opportunities or what do you could call it. So, so, I mean, I was so apologetic, you know, and you saw this guy, 15 year old, I uh, gave chance. Uh. So, I mean, we have our own lanes. We have got to keep to our own lanes. And of course, from this, we are able to understand that in life, I'm speaking from a very pastoral perspective. In life, it's all about the building blocks that we are building. We are built on one another in our lives. Even though those mistakes, those wrongdoings that we encounter, even though that we, we deviate at times, we learn from our failures and mistakes. And usually all these is for the refinement of our character to be more and more like the Lord. The Lord works in us. The Lord is full of grace. The Lord is full of mercy. Yet at the same time, He's not giving us a license to go and live our lives any old how. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not saying that. We know that God is always full of grace and full of mercy. He's giving us opportunities to turn ourselves back to Him. And this is good news for all of us, that we need God to just hold us 
by the hand. And I see life more in a cyclical manner rather than a linear manner because Western thinking or Western education teaches us that life is actually linear. You just go one step, two steps, and you go this way. But why can't life be cyclical? That's why we have the four seasons. It's not summer all the time. It's not spring all the time. There are times there are autumn where you just go through the, drought, the dark and dreary fall. Sometimes it's winter that you need to hibernate and, and to just shut yourself away. I've actually spoken a series on the seasons of life. And we need to just shut ourselves away and to hibernate and to re regain the strength that God wants to fire us up again. And so we know that it's cyclical. It's like going up a mountain. It's so difficult to climb up like that in a linear manner. And I think it's slightly easier if we go round and round and round, right to the very top. So we know that God actually brings us through cycles, and we are still growing. Sometimes we feel that we are not heading anywhere, but actually we are. If we look at it from the plan or the top perspective, that we are actually climbing up the mountain nicely, and we are getting right to the top. So we learn from our mistakes, we learn from our failures, and we thank the Lord that the Lord is refining us. And there's this divine exchange that took place more than 2,000 years ago. He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And we know that weeping is only for a night and joy comes in the morning. And we thank God that God actually can just turn all these things and to enable us to find the redemptive purposes as to what are all these things for so that we can learn and to grow as a person to be more and more like Jesus. So first thing is we need to learn from our failures and our mistakes. The second thing is to take stock of our lives. What are the areas of our gifts and what are the areas of our talents? What have we been doing? What have we been serving? And to really discover what are the things that are effective and what are the things that are not effective. And sometimes we hear people say, you got to work on your weaknesses. I beg to defer. We have to work on our strengths. Forget about the weaknesses because we shouldn't focus on those areas that are weak at. Just focus on a strength so that we can grow from strength to strength. So it can become better and better and to fulfill all that God has given us to do. So even as the Lord begins to shape us, begin to see what are the things that we are effective in and to focus on that so that we can be better. You know, the Lord has called me into full-time ministry. I've been a pastor since 1990. It totally doesn't make sense for me to go and try to be an engineer right now. You think so? Unless God says, okay, suddenly spoke to Noah, go and be a shipbuilder, you know, get out of your business and do shipbuilding because there's a storm that's coming. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Unless God is saying that to me. If not, it doesn't make sense at all being a pastor, trained as a pastor, serving as a pastor. Hey, uh, can you just go and become an engineer? I can't even count for nuts. 1 plus 1 is 11. So we know that we need to have the skill set and God is showing us His ways. So what is Yahweh saying to us? So what kind of ministry gifts and grace do I have? And really focus on that. That's why the word gifts is actually, in the Greek, it's called charismata. Charismata is actually from the root word charis. And we all know charis is actually grace. So we know these gifts are actually gifts of grace in which God has given to all of us so that we can contribute to the body of Christ. And these gifts is not to display and say, hey, look, I'm so gifted. I've got this, I've got that, I've got everything. You know, I'm so anointed. What's the point? You know, one time I was asking the Lord, Lord, give me more anointing. I was so excited. It's a revival. I pray, God, give me more anointing. Guess what he said to me? Son, what for? And sometimes God speaks to me like that. For what? Oh yeah, for what? Now? If I don't use the anointing, what's the point? And nowadays being a pastor is not easy because <clears throat> there are prophecy collectors. 
What do you mean by that? They come to the altar, straight away they whip out a handphone. Uh, what is the Lord saying to me? Uh, how do I know? <laughs> I don't know. I cannot magically work out something, oh, you know, shandai, shandai, untie my bow tie and say something to you. I cannot say that. Unless it's really the Lord's anointing and giving me the insight and to share. It cannot just come to a point where I just give you something, you know. The best thing to say to you is, the Lord says, read your Bible. You know? <laughs> so we need to understand that God has given us gifts and ability and the Lord has actually given me the ability to listen to others. I don't know where I find a patience. It's really by the grace of God. Patience to listen to others and they keep pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and, and the Lord has blessed me with a broadcasting voice. Quite nice, right? The voice. So, and the Lord has given me this gift of preaching. I imagine it's quite a good gift that He has given me. I better stop because you think that I'm howling. <laughs> so, we need to understand that God has given us gifts. So, focus on that, make use, and to really exercise all that God has given to us. And I know that the Lord wants us to build up all those areas. The portion that God has marked out for me and for you. Marked out for us. God has already a book of remembrance. That He has written a scroll about you and me, our lives. And so all it takes is to ask, Lord, show me. What's in that scroll? Lord, show me. What have you written about me? The best thing that you can do is to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you think of me? It's not some narcissistic kind of thing, you know, in, in which we need to understand that we need to ask God, Lord, what do you think of me? You know, in our church, we've been growing in this in terms of identity, authority, and the value that all of us carry. And I think this is something that is so precious and important for us. And we thank the Lord. God has been revealing to us all that He is putting together for every one of us as we grow together as a body. And we know that we are here to grow together as a body of Christ. And we listen to the Lord. And I, I can assure you, God will tell you. All you have to do is to ask, Lord, what do you think of me? And the Lord will just pour out His love. And one song spoke to me so clearly and God was speaking to me. And He ran to me took me in his arms, held my head against his chest, and said, son, you're mine. That song is called um, When God Ran. It's such a beautiful song. And Yahweh would just sing over us. I think it's in Zephaniah or whatever. Last week, the Lord dances over us. That he just come, and he just draws us, come into my chamber so that I can be, we can behold the fiery eyes of the Lord. And says, come and behold the bridegroom and to spend the time with him. And the Lord will just pour out his heart and his treasures into our lives. And the things that nobody would ever know is the secret in which God wants to share with you. Because our lives is a personal encounter, personal relationship with the Lord. A race marked out for us. Romans 12 verse 3 says, think soberly. All the gifts that God has given to us, we need to receive it and to just thank the Lord. You know, I mean, sometimes when people say, hey, you are so gifted in this area, what's the first response? Ayanola. Hey, are you sang very well. Ayanola. You know what is he actually saying? Hey, tell me more, tell me more. You know, it sounds good. Hey, come on. So, no la, no la. Hey, good la, no la, good la. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God has given me this gift. The Lord has given us gifts, different gifts, different people. And we just want to grow in that. And, and we know that, as I, I think I've shared this before, the wife, the one, two, five talents, be contented with what we have. I'm always amazed with the two talent guy. He didn't say, hey, why you have five talents? I have only two. Neither did he say to the one talent guy, hey, you only got one, eh, I got two. 
So we need to understand that God has given us different portions, um, a race that is marked out for all of us. And thirdly is to allow the leaders to speak over our lives, just like the Apostle Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Fan into flame the gifts given to you through the laying on of my hands. So, of course, the Apostle Paul knows exactly the gifts in which the Lord has bestowed upon Timothy. He's always encouraging him to persevere. The Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. Don't worry, you know, don't let no one despise your youth and, and so on and so forth. The Lord is constantly using the Apostle Paul to encourage Timothy to persevere. And just like Paul himself, he says, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. So all of us, this race is marked out for us. We've got to keep running so that the day will come that we can truly say, I fought the good fight. Now, when you say fought good, the good fight, what does it mean? It means that you are actually engaging in warfare. You're engaging in a fight. It's not a walkover that the enemy will just say, hey, uh, please, you know, go ahead. The enemy will put all kinds of stoppages, all kinds of opposition to discourage us, to stop us from fulfilling all that God has in store for you and for me. We are more than conquerors. We are made overcomers. Those who persevere to the end will be saved. So the Lord is constantly reminding us, finish the race. All of us have to run and kept the faith. There is no giving up. Some people keep the faith. They keep it in the storage. They keep it in the shelves. They kept the faith there. No. The Lord is actually saying, kept the faith means that we continue to exercise all that God has given to us and to become dedicated and commitment, uh, committed to what He has given us. That he, and He says that, in other words, when He says, I have, it means that it is done, it is completed, it is finished. That's why also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, it says, Therefore, I run thus not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it to subjection. Better than Wing Chun, he is actually constantly boxing, knowing exactly what to do, where to hit the enemy, where to hit the opponent. Rather than just beating the air, you know, where is this guy coming from? He doesn't know. We know that he is so filled with the wisdom of God. He is not fighting without any uncertainty, right? So all we have to do is to keep on keeping on and keep at it as long as the Lord says, go for it. Commitment and dedication. I mean, I truly honor the healing rooms. Every Monday, it's not funny, you know. Every Monday is a lot of dedication, a lot of commitment. I mean, every time you hear problems, it's not easy. Every time someone comes to you, I've got this, I've got that, I've got all kinds of stuff. You see, sometimes we just take the problems onto ourselves. And we thank God for the ministry or even other ministries, dance ministry, worship ministry, Week in, week out, they come early, practice. Sometimes instead of being encouraged, hey, you're singing no good, eh? or you're playing no good, eh? or how come out of tune, how come this, how come that? Eh? I mean, this is the body of Christ. We don't owe anybody anything. Let's encourage, let's teach one another to persevere. So what is persevere? It's steadfastness, constancy, endurance, and in the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. A patient, enduring, sustaining perseverance. This is taken from the Blue Letter Bible, right? This is one of the keys or one of the tools that you can actually have. Another one that one must pay is the Logos Bible software. But if you want something that is easily available, you have Bible Hub, and that is free, Bible Hub, and Blue Letter Bible. So if you want to do a word study, just go to that particular passage, click on it, and then 
in the, in, the, in the Hebrew language, they give you the passing. In other words, what voice is written, the grammar. I'm the one doing it, or someone doing for me, or whatever it is, past tense, or is it uh, imperative? In other words, a commandment, or whatever it is. So all these are very useful for us to learn the Word of God and to fully glean all the truths and what God has in store for all of us. So this is taken from the Blue Letter Bible. So that when we study this word persevere, then you realize, oh, it's steadfastness, constancy, endurance. And in New Testament, it talks about a person who doesn't swerve from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. And so when we start applying this to our lives, we begin to ask ourselves, what are the trials that we face? What are the sufferings that we face? What are the temptations that we face? What are some of the things that we need to keep persevering? I mean, it's, it's so exciting to learn the Word of God, amen, that you just glean and draw and allow the inspiration to come out and says, oh, I begin to see it this way. I begin to see it that way. The Lord is speaking this to me and, and I'm growing as a person. I mean, it's so fantastic, right? So what does it mean? The definition is to be steadfast, constancy, endurance. So in the Singlish version, what is the Singlish version? So like that, uh, I also must uh, to run uh, with perseverance. <laughs> I need to always be steadfast, constant, very, very constant. Endure, uh, tong, uh, you know, you've got to run all the way and don't give up, you know. Or oh, loon, <laughs> run, okay. So we need to understand that. So we've got to, first of all, is looking at if you turn to Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at the, this is only the, oops, sorry, this is only the introduction. Huh? Let's look at Hebrews 12 again. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the word therefore, you need to understand what is it there for. Is a continuation of what has been previously written. So it's like a conclusion. It's like those days you do math, you have the three dots, like tick, 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 therefore, you have this plus this plus this, therefore equals to that whatsoever. And so we know that therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and this is actually speaking to all of us, that who are these clouds of witnesses? These cloud of witnesses are people who have gone before us, who have endured, who have persevered, who have overcome and were victorious. And we are surrounded by them. Some schools of thoughts tell us that we can actually communicate with them through the Lord Jesus. Some of us say that, oh, that's necromancy, you know, calling up the dead. No. When you enter into the spiritual realm, you're able to communi communicate spirit to spirit. So that's why you say we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Where are the heavenly places? Of course, they are not on earth. So anyway, who are they? We look at verse uh, chapter 11. It talks about the hall of faith, right? Of all the, the wonderful people who have gone before us. But we look at verse 32 onwards. I'd like to read very quickly. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead race to life, Again, wow. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They persevered right to the very end. Even they, they tried to save them. They says, no, I will continue to be steadfast. That they might op obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of course, and of chains and imprisonment. Notice uh, verse 37. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. It's not magic show. Sawn in two were tempted were slain with a the sword. They wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins, 
being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, and they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, therefore, since you are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So just look at this various character, perseverance, Abraham, called by the Lord, promised with the inheritance, and yet, at the same time, he persevered through the many years of not having a child. I mean, it's like, the Lord says, you're going to have this, and then you look at others having it, and you're still not having it. How do you feel? Of course, at that point in time, Sarai was saying, hey, uh, maybe we should help God. Uh, why don't you just go and uh, you know, sleep with my maid, Hagar? We know that that's by the flesh. And what did Abraham say? Okay, Lord, since you call me, then I, okay, Lord. He should say, come on, I'm a one-woman man. I'm totally committed to you, my darling. I will not go and lie around or lay around with any other women because I love you and you alone. Don't tell me about going to my, this maid whatsoever. But he did not. He did not. He listened to his wife. Okay, la, okay, la. So we know that he went to a lot of trouble because of that. So they persevered, and eventually they have Isaac. Right? You know the story. Noah, according to some scholars, they say it takes around 70 to 100 years to build the ark. You think he persevered for 70 to 100 years doing the same thing, putting the wood together, hammering nails, and that's not it. With all people turning around him, mocking him. You're crazy. What are you doing? Rain? There's no such thing as rain. Those days they only have dew. There's no such thing as rain. And what are you, what are you doing? And why are you I mean you're mad, you know, everyday people will just turn around and say, You're mad, you're mad, you're mad. If everyday people say you're mad, in no time you really think you're mad. Perse perseverance. Or Job. Yesterday in our service, you know, one of our speakers was actually sharing with us about the insight into Job chapter 2. I tell you, it's so mind-blowing. If you want to listen to it, you can go to our church Facebook and listen to it. The insight of how God revealed himself, the undivided dedication that Job has, because we are always filled with choices. But he made the choice and not turn against God and to continue being faithful to the Lord. You see, let's not get it. Okay, anyway. So is it, it's so easy to say, okay, forget it. No, I mean, I'm not going to do it. I just want to give up and get sucked in, sucked in by all the worldly pleasures and all the worldliness and etc., etc. So firstly, looking at those examples, the great clouds of witnesses. The second thing is looking away. You can look past. What are we supposed to look away let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Right? So you have these two things, a weight and sin. If you look at the Amplified Version, it means to strip off, lay aside. In other translations, throw aside every encumbrance, every weight, put off, rid ourselves, put off, put aside, put away. Every weight. And the word weight is actually Arkos. It means something that is bulky, something that is massive, a burden that is full of weight, I mean, very heavy and, and full of encumbrance, right? So, we ask ourselves, when we are running this race, what are some of the weights that try to weigh us down? What are some of the things that hinders us from running smoothly and swiftly in this race? What are some of the weights that weigh us down? Firstly, burdens of life. 
How many can associate with that? There are so many burdens. Worries. You know, some people are so worried that they worry that they don't have worries. They are so worried about not having worries. How can everybody having worries and they've got no worry? Then they start to get worried. So <laughs> it's called the irony of life. The cares of life, you know. I, uh, my son didn't go to this school. Uh, you know, I mean, all the cares of life and, and things that all. One of the biggest things that affects people today, COVID, right? And of course, Elder Thomas declared, it is gone. And we praise God for that. We need to keep pushing back the frontiers of darkness and to just allow the light of God, God to shine. Trials and tribulations, concerns and, and things like that. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, don't worry. You will not add an inch to your height. Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 6. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has got enough troubles of its own. First Peter 5, 6 says, cast all your cares, all your anxieties upon him. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. The second thing is sin. This word is actually hamatia. All right? It means to miss the mark. It means to fall short. It means to wander away from the tracks of righteousness from the, and walk into the paths of unrighteousness. We wander away. We, we lose our way. We get off the, the lane and, and we just wander from the laws of God, violation of God's law in thought and word and deed. And like I said just now, grace is not the license for us to just live our lives in a manner that is any old how. There's a big difference between falling into sin and living in sin. There's a big difference. So may the Lord teach us, teach us what's the difference. Don't live in sin. I mean, there are times we fall into sin, sometimes through ignorance, sometimes through weakness, a deliberate fault, whatever it may be. But if we are constantly in that, living in that sin, then I think we need help. We need deliverance. We need God to take us out of that and to set us free. You know, because it's like the Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 4, don't let the sun go down on your anger lest it becomes a foothold. So if there's an open door for the enemy to come in, we can start with just one view of pornography. And then if we get more curious, we start to watch more and more and to the point that we cannot stop watching. And so we need to understand from an open door, it becomes a beachhead. I mean, war strategies, we all know. A beachhead, and then a foothold, and then a stronghold, and then a bondage. There's one particular country, one particular district, one particular place. This now is a very popular red-like district. It started with just having only one bar servicing the sailors. One bar became two, two became four, four became eight, it became multiplying until right now is a very infamous district. You have all kinds of vices, bar top dancing and everything. Not that I go into all those places. You walk past, you can see for yourself. They're all there fully displayed and people will cut, start soliciting and say, do you want this, do you want that, do you have this service, that service, all kinds of stuff. And so we know that we can, when there's an open door, it will eventually become a bondage. So we need to understand that these are besetting sin, as some uh, translation, besetting sin, which is persistent, right? And so it was John, the, uh, John Wesley who said, you cannot prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest on your head. In other words, temptation itself is not sin, but yielding to temptation, then it's sin. So we cannot prevent a bird from flying over our heads, but we can prevent it from building a nest. Another, uh, this says, ensnares us. Ensnare is actually a trap. It's like a spider web, you know, that's built to trap flies that's flying into it without knowing. And the enemy is constantly using, just like in Psalms 91, the snare of the fowler. And all these snares are usually connected with pleasure, with profit or advantage. And we all know that sin 
is pleasurable. Right? So we know that we need to ask the Lord to get all this out of our lives. Every single day we are faced with all this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We need to ask the Lord to enable us to overcome all these things. One of the best ways is to flee instead of going head on to all these things that we are facing. You know, sin provides the legal authority for the devil to attack us. When we open ourselves up to those areas, then we realize that enemy can just come in and attack us. So looking away and after that, looking unto Jesus, fixing our eyes. What does it say? Looking unto Jesus, the author, number one, the author and finisher of our faith. Number two, for the joy that was set before him. And number three, endured the cross, despising the shame, has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we know all these got to be get rid. All these things that hinders the weight and the sin that hinders us from running this race. Imagine you're carrying a big load running. It's so different from running with just t-shirt and shorts and then carrying the backpack that you're running with, with that. It's, it's difficult. So we need to get rid of that. And after getting rid of that, we need to keep looking unto Jesus because we know that God alone is the solution to our life's race. The Lord, we need to keep running and focusing. You see, what we see is important. How we put our gaze. And we need to constantly fix our eyes on the Lord. It's just like, you know, I, I sat on a bum boat. How many of you know what's a bum boat? Or they call it a pump boat, actually. Right in front of the boat, there is this wooden stick. And this boat master is constantly looking at the stick. I see, what's so nice about a stick? What is he looking at? Actually, the stick, when he put against the destination, he is aligning his direction with the stick to the destination. And so he's going towards that that which he is looking at. So we know that even as we want to finish the race, we have Jesus, the cross, that we keep looking at the cross, aligning the cross to the destination they are heading, and it brings us to that place. And we know that's the direction God is taking us. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. And focus is so important. My granddaughter was reading a book and I came up to her and tried to play with her. And she turned around and looked at me and said, Grandpa, I cannot be distracted. I need to focus. I said, whoa. And she's three years old. <laughs> what sayest thou, you know? So we need to be very focused and looking unto Jesus because it's the perfect example. Enduring the cross, which is physical, despising the shame, which is emotional, mental, and we know that all these affects a person for the joy that was set before him. Now, what does it mean? In other words, he's despising the shame. Is, is in other words, I have this focus, Jesus is saying, the joy of accomplishing, of fulfilling what I'm set to do. That is to die on a cross. And shame, I'm throwing it away. You're immaterial. You're not important. These things are worthless and powerless and I have no, nothing to do with you. I'm just persevering, focusing on the goal in which I'm supposed to fulfill. You see, all these earthly things are just temporal compared to the eternal things that God has in store for you and for me. What does shame do? Shame brings us to the place of embarrassment, the sense of worthlessness, the sense of being useless. But we know that we have a God who says to us, I love you with an everlasting love. I've got eternity prepared for you at a place that the streets are paved with gold and, and we need to be so focused. Just like some women going to shop the broken back. So focused. And I was asking myself, what's so nice about that back, you know, the, the broken back, right? And so I went to do a search. I said, wow, 1,005. 1,005 was only for the strap. 
which is for the casual bag. It's not even the luxury series. Oh, man. Yeah, some things baffle us. So, we need to be so focused. So, the question we ask ourselves is, what do we do when we feel like giving up? When we are running this race with perseverance, we have to fix our eyes. We need to persevere. We need to put aside all these things, cast away and throw away and get rid of all these things, the weight and the sin and etc. And the, one of the ways which I, I find it very, very helpful, just like Paul and Silas, when you, you are so down and out, you start worshipping the Lord. And then we know that prison doors will be opened. There was an earthquake, you see, in Acts chapter 16. Another is to pray, just like when Peter was arrested, the, 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 the entire church started praying, and then he came knocking at the doors because miraculously he was let loose and he came knocking at the door and the servant girl, Rhoda, came and opened the door and saw Peter and straight away closed the door because she saw a ghost. And this tells me how often we don't believe in what we pray for. So may the Lord help us. So in summarizing all these, the Lord says to us, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, learn from the examples, all that they have been through and all that they have suffered. Let us lay aside. Let us cast away. Let's throw away all these things. Every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance, with perseverance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray, let's pray shall we? Thank you, Lord. Let's pause for a moment and... And if you're running this race and you're packed with all kinds of weights and maybe even sin that's affecting your life, the way to come out of it is to cast it away, remove it, throw it away, get rid of it, and to say to the Lord, Lord, help me, O oh God. The Lord has done it on the cross of Calvary. Turn your eyes upon Jesus because he has despised the shame. He has endured the cross. All we need is to just come humbly before him and say, Lord, take over. Set me free. Some of us are like carrying the baggage, a heavy baggage on your back. And he went up to the bus. And when you went up to the bus, instead of putting your bag down, you're still carrying it. And the Lord is saying, why don't you just put it down? You're already on the bus. The Lord has already done it for us. Don't carry this burden. Release it to the Lord. And so Lord, say, Lord, take over. And the Lord is encouraging every one of us to run with perseverance. Looking unto Jesus. Ask the Lord for a fresh glimpse of who He is, what He has done, and who He has made us to be. If today you are saying, I'm just tired, I'm tired of running, I'm feeling very low and discouraged, and there's so many things that have been affecting me, the worries of life, the cares of life, the burdens that... It may not necessarily be sin, but there are so many concerns and it's already affected me. Raise your right hand and say, then please pray for me. If that's your situation, just raise your right hand where you are. I'd like to pray especially for you. God bless 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 you. Is there anybody else? Just raise your right hand. I'd like to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Shall we all stand? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I just want to thank you for those hands that have been raised to you, Lord. Not only you see the hands, you see the hearts. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that Lord, that you come alongside them. Holy Spirit, you are the paraclete. You are the parakaleo, that you come alongside us to help us to carry the burden.
to be our comforter, to be our counselor. And Lord, your word says to cast all our cares, all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. So Lord, I pray that you sweep over this entire auditorium, this entire sanctuary. Lord, we just want to lay it down, Lord. We want to lay it down. We want to lay it down. We want to lay it down. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Remove them, Lord Jesus. Some of us may have to go home, take a piece of paper, write down all the burdens, all the cares, all the worries that you have. List them down. And you confess it to the Lord and say, Lord, I have this problem, I have this burden, I have this tension, I have this care, I have this worry. I have... Write it all down and confess it and surrender. And after doing so, lift up the paper and say, I'm surrendering it all to you. Tear it up and close in prayer. Some of us may need to do that this afternoon. Try doing that. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Just like we have sung the hymn, It is well with my soul. If you know the story behind this hymn, you really appreciate the lyrics. Because this man lost his family and he wrote the hymn. Despite of losing the family, he says, It is well with my soul. So Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here, Lord. I pray that you minister to our hearts, to our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that you continue, Lord, to encourage us, help us to run this race with perseverance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, you're the one who started it. You're the one who's going to Finish it till we meet you face to face. So teach us, Lord, perseverance. Teach us, O oh God, to hang on. Teach us to keep holding on to your hand, O oh God, and to run. We give you thanks, Lord. We commit every single one of us here to you, Lord. Bless them. Lord, we pray especially for City Missions Church. Lord, we know, O oh God, that at this season, that everything seems transitional. That it is season that things may change, Lord. And Father, I pray that, Lord, that in your own special way, that, Lord, that you bring them even to greater heights and more glorious days. And Father, I pray that this church will truly fulfill the DNA, the culture in which you have set on this church, Lord. To be a city church, preaching Christ to the nations. We just want to thank you, Lord, for the many mission efforts being served out in this church. I truly pray that you empower your people, everyone. As we go, we go with the name of, the Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we go with the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, bless this entire church. Bless the leadership. Bless Elder We, together with the rest of the elders. We pray that, Lord, together, be able to serve your purposes in this generation, O oh God. We give you all the praise, give you all the glory. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen.